Hello and welcome to this video which is going to introduce um, Smart HTC, uh, a method to measure the overall thermal performance of buildings developed by Build Test Solutions. Uh, I'm Richard Jack, I'm the Technical Director of Build Test Solutions. So what we're going to cover in this video is first off um, what an HTC is, so we'll try and uh, make sure we're not using too much jargon uh, and then move through to why we're going to measure HTCs uh, and then the nuts and bolts of carrying out a smart HTC measurement including uh, what sensors to use, where to put them and how to carry out the calculation on our online software and we're going to finish off with some example use cases. I often find that I've touched on those in going through the slides so we'll see how we go. So I want to start off with this piece of contact setting, which is uh, what in general affects how much energy will be used in a building. And I think there's three key tenets. So the first is people. Uh, if you have a higher set point, uh, if you use more appliances, you're going to use more energy in that building. Uh, the second would be the systems. So if I have a highly efficient energy, uh, highly efficient heating system and ventilation system, then I've got a good chance of using less energy, less carbon emissions. And the third, which is what this is really about, is the fabric thermal performance of the building itself. They're re each key and they really interlink. So if you had low heat loss, good fabric performance, that would mean that the, the marginal effect of the residents having the temperature set point said to be one degree higher or lower would have less relative impact. Um, and it might enable you to have a, a low carbon heating system. All of that is within an environment which just says if it's dark and cold outside, we need more energy to keep it warm and bright inside. So what is this HTC? The HTC is the heat transfer coefficient. Um, and it's a measurement of the total rate of heat transfer between inside and outside uh, your house. Uh, it includes all sources of heat transfer, so it's going to be through the fabric, by which I mean through the floor, through the walls, through the windows, through the doors, through the ceiling, uh, by ventilation, so deliberate air movement, and by infiltration, um, accidental air movement, through the building fabric. So it's a measurement of that total rate of heat transfer, and it's completely critical for your energy performance. So if you have good thermal performance, you need less energy to keep it warm in size and the energy consumption for the building will be lower. The units of this heat transfer coefficient are watts per Kelvin. So watts, we're talking about a rate of energy transfer, joules per second. Uh, per Kelvin, we're talking about the temperature difference between inside and outside. So that's saying when it's colder outside, we're going to have a higher rate of heat transfer through the building than we would uh, if it was warmer outside. It also works in reverse. So if you're thinking about cooling a building in a hot climate, then your heat transfer coefficient would be, uh, you could either think of it as the rate of heat transfer from the warm outside to the cold inside, or the rate of cool, the rate of uh, heat transfer of the cold uh, inside to the warm outside. So the heat transfer coefficient isn't normalized by anything to do with the size of the building. Um, so if you had a really energy efficient warehouse, it would still have a high heat transfer coefficient compared to lots of houses just by virtue of um, being very large. So in order to compare buildings of different sizes, we use this metric, the heat loss parameter, and that is the heat transfer coefficient divided by the total floor area of the building. So there you can compare between buildings of different sizes. And to do that, we use this heat loss parameter scale on the right hand side of this slide. Uh, and so if you're in the zero to one range of the heat loss parameter scale, you've got really excellent thermal performance. So we'd be thinking passive house level heat loss. Uh, one to two is good. Most new builds would fit in there or retrofitted buildings. Two is a good target to get to. It's an achievable target for, um, for most retrofits. Two to three is average thermal performance, but not the sort of average you tend to be proud of. So not great thermal performance. And three plus is really quite poor heat loss in a building that's badly in need of some retrofits to reduce the heat loss. So that's what a heat transfer coefficient is. Just to get, make that hopefully a little bit more tangible, 
Here we're looking at the predicted heat loss, so the predicted heat transfer coefficient for a typical um, flat built in the 1960s. Here, the majority of the heat loss is predicted to be through the fabric of the building. Uh, and there's significant contributions also uh, by infiltration and ventilation. If we think about the fabric in particular, uh, most of that heat loss, and we're looking at the bottom right donut chart here, is predicted to be through the floor and the windows. Uh, that's because the building has a lot of glazing on the back. There's even more glazing than there is on this front side. And it's got heated flats to either side and above, so it's not predicted to have high heat loss through the walls. When we actually went and measured the heat transfer coefficient of this building using Smart HTC, we found that the real heat loss was actually more like 130 watts per Kelvin, so significantly less or better um, than the prediction. And the main causes of the difference were that we found the building was significantly more airtight than expected. That means that the infiltration heat loss was significantly less than expe uh, expected or calculated. And uh, the ventilation was found to be basically non-functional in here. It's supposed to have extract ventilation in the kitchen and the bathroom and, and neither were really working. Um, so the, the, the heat transfer by air movement was much lower than expected which means less heat transfer, but not overall a good story because there was really insufficient ventilation in this flat and a really bad mold risk. Um, so the flat needed much better ventilation, much more fresh air to avoid that. Uh, and we found that out by doing air tightness measurements and um, uh, flow hood measurements of the, of the delivered ventilation in addition to the smart HTC measurements. Uh, and for the fabric heat loss, we found that was even a little bit less than predicted as well, uh, because the walls, which because of when they were built and because you couldn't see any drill holes to show retrofit, you wouldn't expect there to be any uh, insulation in their cavity, but actually there was, so they had slightly better thermal performance than expected. So that all added up to the predicted heat loss being worse than the actual law measured heat loss. So, that's a little bit of an example of why it's a good idea to measure uh, the heat transfer coefficient because uh, the predicted performance by something like the standard assessment procedure has been found in lots of research studies and this is a, a busy slide to demonstrate those to often vary from the actual performance as demonstrated by measurements. Um, and in this sort of seminal study that the chart in the middle is from, which was from Leeds Beckett University, uh, Professor Johnson et al, they did uh, heat loss measurements, heat transfer coefficient measurements in 25 buildings and found that the, the measured heat loss was 60% worse on average than the prediction. So we're not talking about differences of five and 10% here. We're talking about really big differences. Uh, it's quite common for the buildings to, for buildings to perform completely different uh, to that prediction. And as we go through looking at some examples, I'll start giving some examples of particular buildings and why the prediction varied from the measurement, just to give a bit of an idea of that. But the key point here is that it is common for them to vary and, and the measurement allows you to think specifically about a particular building and better understand its thermal performance. So the thermal performance is important for some obvious reasons. If the thermal performance is different to expected, then the amount of heat that you need to keep it warm inside will be different to expected. Uh, that will mean you use uh, more or less energy, produce more or less carbon. It's got a cost impact as well, of course. There's also um, some less obvious connotations or, or results of that. Um, for instance, if you had uh, in that example of the fact we had less less uh, ventilation and infiltration than expected and we had as a consequence a real air quality and mold risk um if it was the opposite and you had a drafty building and you had drafts at floor level then humans when they get their exposed uh, extremities to their feet or their hands get cold they feel colder so you need a higher internal air temperature to deliver the same amount of thermal comfort uh, so we generally say that um, unexpected performance leads to unintended consequences. So it's not just energy performance that gets impacted, it's all these knock-on things as well. 
So now we're going to look at um, some examples where we've measured the thermal performance of houses uh, and compared that with predictions. And these predictions uh, are all from the standard assessment procedure. So um, what's used for generating EPCs, energy performance certificates in the UK. So here we're looking at an estate and we're looking particularly at that cul-de-sac uh, circular road in the middle there. And these are semi-detached houses, solid walls built in the 1950s. Uh, they're all built on the same site to exactly the same design of the same materials by the same builder at the same time. You would expect them and they're still owned by the council so they would have been through very similar rounds of retrofit you would expect them to have basically the same thermal performance in this example we see the prediction did well on average so the average performance was only one percent different from the prediction which is pretty remarkable but each building was different to each other to the extent that the building on the left hand side and the right hand side of that chart and each bar in the chart is a different building on on that little road and nearly 100 percent different to each other in heat loss um so if you're thinking about which heating system to put in those two buildings should be treated very differently uh, they'll have significant what 100 percent different um heat demands and that is something that you just couldn't tell by a visual survey and when you start to think about it these houses were built on a muddy field uh, 70 75 years ago uh, and they've probably had several different heating systems since uh, which means new pipe ingresses which have been sealed to different standards they will have had loft insulation which will have been installed to different levels uh, new windows and doors almost certainly in all all of these properties and so each of these little changes they don't they start off a little bit different and over their lifetime they've become really quite different from each other and the measurement allows you to think about one building in particular rather than treat them all identical and say they're the same here we have another example this time we're looking at a low-rise block of flats also probably built in the in the late 60s or 70s and here we measured the htc of pretty much every flat in this block and you can see that on average they performed 14 percent worse they had 14 percent more heat loss than expected from the calculation but there is an enormous range between the flats so they've got really different performance to each other and what happened here was uh, if you look to the left hand side of the chart there on the ground floor there are a row of studio flats they were significantly drastically more airtight than predicted uh there the performance of the the floor and the walls and the windows actually pretty similar um to the prediction so they had less heat loss than expected uh, and so they form this this group on the left hand side of the chart where the the predicted performance um was actually worse than the measurement then we had some flats uh, on the right hand side of the picture they were single story flats uh, quite long and thin also very much more airtight than predicted so they had less infiltration heat loss than expected but where we have that walkway detail that's an exposed concrete slab uh, which is cold on either side of the walkway and a, it's repeated detail on the back with some balconies that in the calculation was thought to have um, an effect but actually has a much worse effect than that and those two factors counterbalance each other so they had less infiltration heat loss than expected but more fabric heat loss than expected and they were about um, as expected uh, and then you had some that performed drastically worse than expected and that's on the left hand side of here the top four stories of the um, flats block of flats at two levels of two-story masonettes they have that exposed detail but instead of it being cold on either side and it's a walkway now it's actually uh, a room a heated space and it was a really drastic much worse than expected um, heat loss much worse than expected u value for that area plus some thermal bridging and so they even with them being also more airtight than expected had significantly more heat loss than expected so even in this one building there is a real range of performance between the building types 
and the individual flats. And the measurement allowed us, in this case, to identify some type failures, uh, but also to think about how the building's really performing and therefore what the best retrofit strategy would be. And so any retrofit strategy in this building is going to have to deal with that thermal bridging issue. Um, yeah. Finally, we've got a sample. Instead of looking at a particular building, we're looking across quite a large sample of homes. Uh, so in this case, more than 500 houses. And this is a study that we did with the Energy Savings Trust um, and the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero. So in this case, we're comparing uh, the predicted on the x-axis and measured heat loss of more than 500 buildings. And we see actually that there is a clear relationship between the two. So the predictions aren't complete nonsense. In fact, they're doing what they are intended to do. And they're on average classifying best, middle and worst performing houses. But what you get is lots of variation for particular houses. So the prediction is good on average but not very good about thinking about a particular building. So for only 42% of those more than 500 houses was the predicted heat loss within the measurement error of the measured heat loss. So for 60% of those houses, even though it was okay on average, we find that the prediction isn't accurate for that particular building. And it was much more common actually for those cases where the, the prediction didn't match with the measurement for uh, the, the heat loss actually to be less than expected. So it was much more common for the house to have better energy performance than expected. Uh, and on average, you can see with that trend line there, maybe you could forecast that forward and say about 20% less heat loss than expected. And in general, as a rule of thumb, I find that it's much more common for a new building to have worse heat loss than expected and the opposite for an older building. The, the rule doesn't fit every time, but it's much more common for a new, new uh, building with predicted to have lower heat loss, to have worse heat loss than expected, and a predict building that's predicted to have high heat loss to be have less heat loss will be better than expected. And I think one of the key reasons for that is that those buildings with low heat loss, they're usually new builds or big retrofit projects where the, the, the SAP standard assessment procedure energy model or energy any energy model by any method, so 12831 for heat pump sizing or PHPP if you're doing um, passive house houses. In those cases, you will know all the materials that are in there. And so you'll, you'll estimate that the U-value of a particular service will be the addition of all those materials taken into account of no build defects or any possibility that the material might not perform as well as it did in the lab. And that actually means that the standard you're trying to live up to is basically the perfect construction of that building. And so really it's almost impossible to do better than expected, but very much possible to do worse than expected. And we could also need to have a little bit of nuance in our understanding of that, because even though they might have a bigger performance gap, perform worse than expected, they're still very likely to have lower heat loss than those other buildings. So they're still good buildings, but they might not be quite as good as we hope they would. On the other side, where we've got these older buildings that are performing better than we expect, maybe there's an opportunity there to be thinking already about more simple heat pump installs than we imagine they might be. Uh, and maybe they don't need quite as much fabric retrofit work as, as we thought they might, which could be important because in a lot of cases, those buildings are hard to treat. And those measures as interventions can be really expensive. So in general, why are we going to measure as built performance? Well, buildings aren't always as they appear in a visual survey. And that is the key reason, I think, for differences between predictions or calculations and measurements, because things vary that you just can't see. So we can't see how airtight a building is. Uh, we can't see if there's, we can't always see if there's insulation in a cavity or how well it's been installed or whether it's um, stopped, well, it stopped working as well over time. So the measurement uh, helps us to understand how buildings and how particular buildings are really working. It should help us to build and retrofit better. So we should be able to target which buildings most need retrofit, understand which retrofits worked and which didn't, which processes worked and which didn't. And over time, that should give us more quality assurance in what we build and start to build trust as well. <laughs> 
So that was a bit of a background in heat transfer coefficients, thermal performance, and measurement of that and why it's a good idea. These slides now are particularly about the nuts and bolts of how we're going to use Smart HTC, which is build test solutions method to measure thermal performance. So in general, the concept is we're going to take some information about the building via a survey. We're going to gather some internal temperature data. We're going to gather energy consumption data. We're going to feed that into the Smart HTC calculator, which lives in the cloud. That's going to go and get local weather data for your site. We're going to do some processing and we're going to turn that sort of mountain of data that's hard to understand and interpret into thermal performance metrics, which are particularly uh, measuring the, the amount of heat loss from your building. So this is a graphic to try and give a bit of a better idea of what's happening inside the Smart HTC calculator. So on the left hand side there, we've got our inputs. On the right hand side, we've got our outputs. And the general idea is that this is an energy balance. So the thing we're trying to measure is the heat loss from the building. But it comes through so many different sources, all your, all your air movement, all your cracks and gaps, all your, all your thermal bypasses, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of measuring them each individually, we're going to measure how much heat we put into the building and infer, therefore, how much heat loss there is. And the sorts of things we're going to account for are solar gains, fuel supply, so that could be gas and electricity. Um, then we're going to think about the efficiency of the heating system, how much hot water use there is, and therefore how much goes down the drain and is wasted heat loss um, or heat input, rather, uh, appliance use metabolic gains from uh, occupants and we're going to come up with our result is the sum of all those heat losses to the right hand side of the occupant there so the sum of all the heat losses through the different routes as well as that bts offer additional metrics which are a mold risk indicator so this is a score from zero to 100 of the mold risk in a particular building based on the monitored temperature and relative humidity the idea of that is that you can start to spot properties that are at particularly high risk of mold and hopefully plan interventions before they get into drastic mold issues. And an overheating risk indicator, which is based on SIBSI's TM52 criteria as used in building regulations now and in TM, SIBSI's TM59. Uh, so that's a monitored uh, observation of how much overheating there is in the building. So this is the real nuts and bolts now, the information we need to feed in to the Smart HTC calculation. Uh, so the first is some information about the building. And each of these inputs, we're going to have a concept of some absolutely required information and some uh, optional additional information. And the more optional additional information you put in, the more precision the result will come with. It'll be accurate in either case, but we can be more precise, have a smaller uncertainty uh, the more optional additional information we have so your required information here is the floor area and we're using that to normalize the htc for the size of the building and the location that's so we can go and get the weather data and the optional additional information is things like your built form and attachments so is it semi-detached is it a detached house is it a flat is it a mid terrace and the parsley wall area that's to help us calculate how much heat gain and loss there could be to neighboring properties, um, the efficiency of the boiler, uh, the window shapes, orientation uh, and glazing characteristics. That's to help us think about solar gains and the number of occupants. That's to help us think about metabolic gains. Now we're thinking about our data gathering. So the two key concepts here are we must have a minimum of 21 days worth of monitoring data. So the calculator will reject any samples of less than 21 days. And this one's a little bit complicated, but we need a daily mean temperature difference of at least seven degrees warmer inside than out. Generally, that means that we're, it limits it, this use to during the winter. So we need it to be during the heating season and there needs to be any heating on and we'll almost certainly achieve that seven degrees. So it doesn't need to be a particular set point or a particular schedule, we just need some heating on to make sure it's warmer inside than outside. The reason we need that is that we're measuring 
the heat loss through the building. So in order to do that accurately, there has to be some heat loss so we can get a, a sensible measurement of it. So our required data in this case is the energy consumption measured at the service meter and the internal temperature in at least one central location. Your optional additional information is more locations for your temperature measurement. We can have relative humidity data. Instead of having meter readings at the start and the end of a period, we could have smart meter data. Uh, if you've got on-site generation, we want to know that about that. Electric vehicle charging, we want to know about that because that is electricity use that is used outside of the home and therefore doesn't provide a heat gain. If you have a heat pump there, we want to know about the heat output and the electricity input. And then the following ones are less commonly used, but you can provide disaggregated heat, heat input for space heating and hot water. So it helps us better understand that split. If you have on-site weather data, there's an option to upload your own, although that is difficult to gather accurately. And I would uh, advise a little bit of caution with that. Uh, and also some monitoring systems have um, detection of occupants and how many people are there at any one time, and that can help to think about the metabolic gains. So this is particular advice about installing temperature sensors. So we call Smart HTC hardware agnostic, by which we mean you don't need to use a particular temperature sensor, uh, but we would recommend that that temperature sensor has an accuracy of at least plus or minus half a degree, and is regularly calibrated. Our aim when we're installing temperature sensors is to get a representative measurement of the average internal temperature around the building. There's an obvious compromise between accuracy. We could have an infinite number of sensors and have a brilliant measurement of the temperature, uh, but it would cost us a fortune and might be impractical. So we want to distribute the sensors evenly around the house. Think about the size of the building. Uh, so if I was in a studio flat, one or two temperature sensors might be suitable. If I'm in a eight bedroom mansion, then I'm going to need more temperature sensors to get a representative measurement around the house. In my own house, I live in a three bedroom house. I have temperature sensors in my kitchen, bathroom, main bedroom uh, and living room and by my thermostat, which is at the bottom of my stairs. And that gives me two sensors upstairs, two sensors downstairs one about in the middle, and I think that's a really nice um, a really nice compromise between accuracy and cost. And we tend to sell sensors in packs of five for that reason. So for sort of typically sized houses, uh, that's a good number to be using. If you have a room with a particularly high mold risk, our mold risk indicator works on a per room basis. So if you're really interested in the mold risk in a room, make sure you've got a sensor in there. Then some practical considerations about where to put them. So they want to be at approximately mid height. You don't need to be too much of a stickler for that, but not within, say, half a meter of the floor or the ceiling. And that's because of stratification. So you can get really cold temperatures at the bottom and hot temperatures at the top. They want to be out of direct sunlight. Again, you don't need to be a big stickler for that, but they definitely don't want to be sat on the windowsill or in full view of the sun. That's because if the sun starts to get on the casing, it'll heat up the casing and it almost cooks the sensor inside and it will get a really unrepresentative measurement of the air temperature. Some obvious ones, they don't want to be right next to something hot like a radiator or a big electrical appliance or in your airing cupboard or something like that. They don't want to be something next to something really cold, so not right next to an air vent. Practically, I normally install these uh, on shelves and things around people's houses maybe behind a picture so it's out of sight, out of mind. If I'm going to mount it on a wall, I definitely won't mount it on an external wall because that wall is cold and it will cool down my sensor. And I like to use those sticky back command strips that you pull down just to try as hard as I can not to damage any paintwork. Now we're talking about energy data. So for energy data, you can either use half hourly smart meter data or you can use the total amount of energy consumption over the period, which would be meter readings taken traditionally by looking at the meter at the start and end of your temperature monitoring. We must include all sources of energy use in the building. That's totally critical. One of the most critical points about getting this measurement right is that we have to include all energy sources. That's because we're inferring the amount of heat loss based on the amount of heat input 
So if we don't measure those heat inputs, we won't get an accurate measurement of the of the heat loss. That means that smart HTC is difficult to use in a couple of particular cases. Uh, for example, where you have unmetered heating, uh, which is most commonly oil tanks or gas bottles. If we can't measure the amount of heating we're using, we can't do smart HTC. Uh, that could also be if people are regularly using a solid fuel or you know an open fire or something. If we're doing that during the measurement, we're not going to get an accurate measurement of the HTC. Also, if there's significant unmetered energy consumption outside the house, and the most common for that would be something like a garden office or an outbuilding, we need to submeter that building and subtract it. Otherwise, we're not measuring the, the heat loss from the one particular building we're concentrating on. Uh, and I'll repeat it again, if, if we've got on-site generation, uh, most commonly solar PV, then we need to measure the generation and the exports uh, of that of that on-site generation so we know how much is used within the building because that's going to lead to a useful heating gain. Uh, so normally you'd be looking at your, your generation meter for that and then your main meter to look at the export to the grid. So here we're talking about smart meter data access. Uh, the absolutely key idea here is that smart meter data, energy consumption data belongs to the residents and you need to have permission from the resident in order to access that for these calculations. One really good way to do that is to work with a free app um, issued by Hildebrand uh, that allows a resident to access their own smart meter data if they do that, you can invite them through smarthtc.com to share their energy data for the purposes of an HTC measurement uh, and that'll allow you to access that data in a format that's really easy to use for your HTC measurements. Um, totally free, but it requires the, the um, participation of the resident to access their own energy data and, and, and accept your invitation to share it. Finally, for heat pumps, uh, we want to know the total electricity consumption of the house, as we always do. But we also want to know the electricity input to the heat pump and the heat output from the heat pump. That's because the performance of heat pumps is really variable with, with outside conditions. Uh, it can also vary with the uh, quality of the install as well. So now I've got a few particular slides about using this one type of temperature sensor uh, which we use a lot for our own um, our own projects and they're called an Elitech temperature logger so there's some software for these that you need to download and you can access that from BTS's website every time we use these sensors we need to set them up before we go to site and then we need to download them before we get back if we don't do the setup before we go to site, then we won't collect any energy data, so the, any temperature data either. So this is totally vital um, that you set them up before you go. It's a quick process. Once you practice with it, you're talking about less than a minute per sensor, but it is essential. So the thing to do is go to the software. If you're using this on a Mac, it will have a different, darker appearance, but it will still operate the same. We select parameter from the top menu after we've plugged in our temperature sensor uh, using the USB cable. We select import template, which BTS will provide to you. Uh, you load that template in. What it does is set the logging interval to half, and it's going uh, to log a temperature reading, and then hit save parameter. And then the last bit, unplug your sensor. It's primed, but not quite ready to go. Press and hold the button in the middle until you see that play sign shown on the right-hand side there. If the play sign showing, then it's login data and we're happy days. If it's not, then we're not going to collect any data. I would normally do all of this in the office before I ever go to a building so that when I arrive there, the sensors are already login data and I can just put them around the house. And then I'm easy to engage with the resident and don't have to be thinking through and making sure that I've done this. And when you upload your data, you're going to specify what, what period that you're going to use the data from. So you don't need to worry about temperature data before you've installed the log or after you take it out of the house, the interface will chop that out of the data set. Now we've had our temperature sensor, we've installed it, it's collected its data, we've collected the sensor again and we'll come to download it. Uh, 
We go back to this Ali Tech software. We go to graph and export report. We're going to save an Excel spreadsheet, normal save as window, and those files that you download, you can automatically drag and drop onto smarthtc.com. You don't have to do any more processing of them or even open them. Okay, so we've collected our temperature data, we've collected our energy data, and now we're coming to run our calculation on smarthtc.com. This is where we access the, the Smart HTC calculator, or if you prefer, you can also um, integrate through APIs with this uh, and integrate it into your own systems. The basic process is we're going to go sign in, either create a building or edit an existing building if it's one you've made earlier. We're going to enter our monitored energy and temperature data, and we're going to get our HTC result. So the create or edit building page is a form with boxes of all the information for you to fill in. If you've done any um, survey in a building before, or particular if you've done any energy assessment for energy performance certificates, this form will feel really familiar to you. We're going to upload our measured data. So if you're using these Elitex temperature sensors, or in fact, most of the main temperature sensors available, uh, the output files from them, you can just uh, also just upload to smarthtc.com without any pre-processing uh, and the, the website interface will do it for you. If you're using data from somewhere else, you can download a template file, copy and paste the data into that and upload it to smarthtc. That's the, the point I was making earlier about it being hardware agnostic. So we upload our data and then we're going to get our results and it's going to give us our, our measured HTC, the confidence interval for that. If you put in the design prediction, it will give you a difference between design and, and measured uh, and it will give us our, our range of performance. It will also give you your required um, heating system sizing. So all our results come there. So let's think about to finish up a few use cases for where these measurements can be really useful. So retrofit design assessment is a really good one. So we know that the calculations aren't always representative of how the building is really performing. So if we measure a building uh, before we do a retrofit, we can think about what, what measures are really required. Maybe we can move straight on to a different heating system or, or renewables and the fabric performance is better than we thought. Or, or if we looked across a whole, a whole suite of buildings, you'll be able to target your focus on the ones that were most poorly performing, most in need of retrofit. There's some funding streams uh, like SHTF, the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund, for example, which really intensifies HTC measurement and the HTC measurement will be funded um, totally under that, that stream. Then if we go back and measure again post-works, we can check uh, that the quality of the works is what it was what it was uh, intended to be. Target remedial works if necessary. We should over time get a better understanding of what works and avoid unintended consequences and improve our our um, processes over time. New build verification, similar idea. Instead of thinking about whether the retrofit works, we're going to compare the measured performance against the predicted performance from whatever software was used to generate that. So most likely in the UK, um, SAP or PHPP. Uh, and it gives it gives you a chance to see if the building is as expected, target remedial work, see what things work really well. It also gives you a way to say, yeah, we really believe in the performance of our buildings. We're measuring them. Here's the proof that they work. Size and heat demand, um, so the heat transfer coefficient gives you an amount of heat loss per degree of temperature difference. If you multiply the heat transfer coefficient by the design internal uh, to external temperature difference, so the, 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 uh, the coldest temperature you want to be able to make sure you've got enough heat for, uh, that will give you the peak heat demand for that property, which is a really key um, determinant how big the heating system needs to be. This is much more common with heat pumps we're finding recently. Um, this is just the heat loss from the building, so it isn't thinking about how much hot water there's been. Uh, it will just tell you the total heat loss, so it won't tell you about radiator sizing. 
uh, it gives you a, a really good way to tell what the overall heat demand is. But we don't say that this is the end of the heat pump design process or the, the heating system install process. There absolutely is still a need um, for people who really know what they're doing with that. And we, we this is in no way a replacement for that. Product development and validation. We do a lot of, uh, we've seen people use our products for a lot of cases where there's a new product um, and people want to demonstrate that it works in practice. So this was a nice project with Airx where they had these active air bricks. So the concept is that you've got subfloor ventilation in a house. We're going to measure and it's there to, to, to ventilate the underfloor to protect the the floorboards to make sure they don't get um, too wet and rot. So instead of having an air brick at all times providing ventilation, we're going to measure the humidity in that subfloor space. If the humidity is low and we don't have a risk to the timber, then we can uh, close off the ventilation and that'll have less heat loss through that floor space. And we did a big sample of more than 100 houses with and without these air bricks and clearly demonstrated their improvement on the energy performance of the buildings. And then I've talked in the cases at the start about um, about these diagnostic measurements. So where you have a difference between a prediction and a measurement of your heat transfer coefficient, your overall thermal performance, these other measurement tools can be a really good way to diagnose why there's that performance difference. Um, so build test solutions provide tools to measure air tightness, which is pulse. Uh, we have the leak checker to find out where any leaks are. Uh, we sell ventilation measurement equipment to see if your ventilation is performing as designed. We have Heat 3D there, which measures U values using an infrared camera over whole surfaces in an hour. So you can see whether the fabric performance is as expected. And we have this free, um, free handbook online, which describes our process for having a, a sort of a triage process of HTC measurement determines whether the overall thermal performance is good is as expected and then you have these diagnostic measurements to see why there's a difference if there is thanks for joining me today um if you have inf if you want information about the products please contact us at the website uh, or through that email address